Hello everyone, this is Dana Theos with EmpowerWomen.com and I am very honored and excited to be here today interviewing Hannah Inam, who just wrote Wired for Authenticity, <laughs> which is an awesome leadership book. I mean, awesome. And I, I, Hannah writes for our blog and I've loved her since the moment I read anything she, she wrote. I mean, everything she says is wise and good. Um, but this book is really an awesome compilation of her philosophy and wisdom around being your whole self in the workplace in a leadership capacity and being authentic. So I'm excited to interview her. Um, so Hannah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. I'm looking forward to being with your community. Well, I want to start, so I have a thousand questions and we won't get to them all. You have to read the book if you want to get to all the questions. <laughs> um, but I really want to start with understanding, you know, who is henna authentically? You know, yeah. where, what is, who is the authentic henna? Yeah, so I'll start off with, um, with that same question that I was asking at, um, I'll say, 35,000 feet when I was sitting on a plane one day, and this was, um, this was now probably, I guess a little, five, seven, eight, seven, eight years ago. I was sitting on a plane and, and trying to ask myself the same question. I, had, um, I was coming back from Basel, Switzerland into Mexico City, Mexico. And my, I had been just recognized by the company I was working for at the time, it was a Fortune 500 company. Um, for business building results. I was one of 10 people in the organization uh, out of 90,000 people that have been recognized. And I'm thinking on the plane, I'm thinking I should really be happy. And, um, and I realized that um, I was happy, but I wasn't happy, happy. And I think you and I both know what that sort of means. We've got our things and everything on the outside looks pretty good. And uh, when you scratch the surface and you look inside, um, as I did on that very long flight, I think long flights make for existentialist thoughts, um, that, you know, I wasn't really all that happy. And, and it started me um, on a path of really figuring out what would make me happy because I had a formula for success and happiness, which was, you know, climb the corporate ladder, be successful, achieve a lot, you know, build your resume and then you'll be successful and then you'll be happy. And here I was at the pinnacle of my career up to that point in time and I wasn't really. And so it, it got me starting to think about who I was really authentically. And I realized that, you know, who I am and I, a lot of what I write about in the book, who we are as, as um, any of us are a compilation of lots of different facets. And unless all of those facets somehow um, make friends with one another, um, and are at ease with one another that we continue to find parts of ourselves that are missing uh, and when those parts are missing that they really um, prevent us from having um, a sense of fulfillment a sense of peace and so who I was up to that point in time and I still am is a, a, a high achiever somebody who's got always like looking for the next thing the next goal to set the next, um, you know, dream to go after. And so that's a big part of me. Um, and I also realized, um, and I went off to an ashram and learned how to meditate. We were talking a little bit of earlier about meditation, learned how to meditate and um, really got more deeply connected with myself. And, and what I learned um, more so than anything else, and I think this really goes to the definition of authenticity, mm -hmm. as we search for ourselves, what I learned is to start to pay attention to what brought me joy. And I think when we start to connect with what brings us joy, that's when we discover who we are authentically because society puts a lot of, you know, we teach, we learn a lot and, you know, as we're growing up about who we should be and authenticity is a lot about who we really are and trying to walk away from who we should be and all the labels that we attach to ourselves. So that was a long winded answer. Sorry. Well, it gave me many thoughts. So now I have more questions. Okay. <laughs> What I find really, really interesting about your answer, I find a couple things interesting. One is that you're defining authenticity holistically. So you're making the observation that we are many people within us. You know, we're a 
parent or a partner or a, a boss at work and a subordinate at work and you know a partner to some of the people we work with blah 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 so you could go down the list and find all these identities inside each of us but I hear you talking about authenticity as getting beneath those identities and identifying some core identity that really feeds all those parts of us and then kind of holding on to that and, and operating from that core. I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, but yes. that's my yes. experience that kind of goes along with what you're talking about. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I in the book, um, I define the authentic self as the core intelligence that is in our very deepest core, um, which is highly creative. It's highly adaptive. It knows how um, to make peace with all of the different parts of ourselves. Uh, and if we can just connect to that, you know, I think we've all had experiences, certainly I have, I know you have, I know all of our listeners have had experiences when they felt completely at ease, uh, completely at peace, probably highly engaged, energized, motivated. Um, and it, those are the times I think when we are firmly connected with our authentic self. And I think the reason why we need this new definition of authenticity is not like you know, this is who I am, like here's the box, here's who I am, take it or leave it, is we live in a world that is changing so rapidly. And it's a world and a marketplace that's global um, where we're often interacting with virtual teams all around the world. It may or may not have the same values, culture, um, you know, work um, systems that we do, and yet we need to figure out a way to collaborate with them uh, and to communicate with them. And so if we start to become rigid and call it authentic, that's really not what authenticity is in my view. Well, and you're right because our, we are constantly growing and changing and be authentic and be centered in the middle of that change. Absolutely. I love that. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah. We were talking meditation. There you go. So let's talk about authenticity in the workplace because, you know, I get this question when I do workshops and group coaching and individual coaching work a lot, which is like, okay, well, it's one thing to be out in my happy place, <laughs> you know, when I'm with my family or when I'm at the ashram or whatever my, on the golf course, you know, whatever my version of that is. And, and, but when I go into the office, I don't feel like I have permission to be that, or yeah. I feel like if I am that something horrible will happen. Right. Um, because in the workplace, there's this other, you know, we have to fit into that culture and every workplace has a culture. So, so what, how do you see, you know, authenticity in the workplace where, where there is this other culture? How does that really work in a way that benefits us as opposed to getting us in trouble? Yes, yes, yes. I get that question a lot. Um, I get a, a lot of questions around how do you balance authenticity um, with the cultural aspect of it and having to fit in? Um, how do you, um, how do you make sure, how do you know when to speak up and when to shut up, right? Because there are moments, we've all experienced moments when we've spoken up too much. Um, and we've also experienced the dis-ease that happens when we shut up, when we really actually have something to say. And so I truly believe, and this is, you know, an area where I would love for you in all the influence that you have in terms of your leadership circles um, to join me, I really want to create a movement for greater authenticity in workplaces. And it's what we will require is the change in culture of our workplaces, and it will require a change in culture in, within ourselves. Um, we have to be powerful, strong, each one of us as leaders, to be able to push ourselves outside of our fear and our fear stories around being authentic you know we've all been burned yep. and therefore it's very easy for us to sort of have that thought that says well if i do that if i step outside and really express what i feel in this moment that i'm gonna my hand's gonna get slapped or worse i might get fired or so there are all of these fear and fear stories that exist in the workplace and we need all of us as leaders to be able to take that bold step and both be authentic, you know, be able be willing to take that chance and also create cultures and reward people 
um, to be able to take that chance. So I'm act actively recruiting people like yourself who have wide circles of influence or even smaller circles of influence to really take a stand. And all it takes is one person to take a stand um, and start a movement. And so that is my goal. And to come back to your question, some of this, like what is that right balance? Uh, a lot of it has to do with one of the practices I talk about in the book. It's the practice of choose be before do. And the way that I'm identifying or I'm call, calling, what I'm calling authenticity is the fullest expression of me for the purpose of we. And so it's the fullest expression of who I am as a leader. And in, in the full expression, what I talk about is, is picking and choosing the part of me that will best serve the moment, right? So there are situations that we know, we've been in meetings with the boss where we've decided, you know, I gotta, this isn't the right moment to speak up on this particular topic because my either it's not gonna be heard or um, it's not the appropriate context to have this conversation with the boss. And we decided that we wanna have the conversation separately. And we've also decided the other way around. And so the goal here is to really train ourselves as a practice to step into our authentic self because that's the place of centeredness. That's the place of clarity. It's the place of um, what I call courage as well. And to step into that place and make a decision from a place of being empowered as opposed to from a place of fear. Right. And when you choose, you're always more empowered because you've made that choice from a sense of values or strengths or a sense of purpose about what's right in this situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me restate some of what you said because I think it's that important and it tracks exactly with the things that I teach. Yes. Um, that I think there's a misperception a lot of us have that everything going on in our heads has to be out in the world in order for us to be authentic. Yes. And I think that's a, a myth. I don't know where it got started. I have theories, but <laughs> you know, part of being powerful in your authenticity, part of, part of using your authenticity to help you achieve your goals is first of all, being okay with it and knowing, you know, your authentic self internally for no other audience, but yourself. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, and this is, we haven't used the word, but I think it fits here is, is learning mindfulness mm -hmm. so that you can, a, kind of know what your authentic self is thinking or feeling at any point in time, and then create a space, which is the mindfulness, where you're not required to ex say and do anything. Yes. And in that space, make a choice about what, as you said, is appropriate to the situation. Mm -hmm. And those are sort of three parts. You know, what's inside us, the space we're creating to make the choice, yes. which is, I believe, choice is an act of power, yes. personal power. And yeah. then when we put that out into the world, you know, it doesn't have to be everything going on inside of us. Yes. And then we begin to be truly effective. Um, and, and coming to this point where you can actually observe what's going on with you, what your choices are, and what's happening in the outside world, mm -hmm. you know, it takes some work. It takes some self-awareness. And I love, so you give seven practices to inspire, adapt, and lead. And I love all of them. You know, all, I'm going to be assigning your book in my classes. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I can, awesome. I can totally tell because it's like, you know, it just, it's, it's perfect. It kind of leads people step by step to the point where you can get to this place of awareness and seeing what your choices are. Yeah. How, it's it's, how it's you... so great. It's that the, you know, if we, I think as leaders can just learn how to be mindful. And one of the practices that I talk about um, is called staying curious. And it's about staying curious about ourselves as much as we stay curious about others. And it's not about being curious and like taking a snapshot view of who we are or who the other person is, but it's about staying curious, which is you know, having that beginner's mind to say, well, who am I being now? And that, if we can just keep asking ourselves that question, who am I being now? And what's called for in this situation, in this moment, that will best serve the greatest good in this situation or context, I think that is the essence of personal power. I agree, and, and I would also, for people listening to this, 
So you and I have been on this journey for a long time, which is why we teach it, right? Yeah. And for those who are listening to this going, gosh, that sounds great, but I don't really get it. I don't really know where to start. I, I want to suggest that they start with your book because a lot of the exercises that you give in the book, you don't have to like get the big concept to see the power of it in your life. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think that's really valuable as a place to start, you know, just to, to start with these concepts kind of step by step. I am curious, why did you call it wired for authenticity? What's the wired part? Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of neuroscience. There has been so many really great advancements in our understanding of our brain and how it functions and impacts. Most importantly for me, where the fascination is how it impacts our leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, what I started to read about and, and notice is that, uh, that there is now more and more data that suggests that we as human beings are actually wired, our wiring as human beings, our brains, our guts, our bodies are actually wired to be authentic. And that our body actually experiences stress when we're not authentic, when we're not being authentic, when we're driven by our fears, um, it creates enormous levels of stress. And so the wiring piece is really about how the health and well-being of each and every individual that is working in the, in the workplace is impacted by the workplace culture. And if we can just create cultures of greater authenticity where people can let their guards down, where we don't have to show up and put masks on uh, about who we really are because we're afraid, uh, I think that not only does it you know, enormously benefit the organization in terms of creating inclusive cultures where people can really thrive and, and innovate, um, it creates fantastic opportunities for us um, to be healthy. And so we can imagine the billions of dollars that we can save. There's, um, there's a wonderful book that I'm going to recommend. It's called Love 2.0, and it's by a um, research, researcher, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. Uh, and she talks about how um, the authentic connection with one another, which she calls micro moments of connection, where we've let our guard down, where we're truly being connected to one another in a very open-hearted way with one another, that actually that improves the health of our vagus nerve, which goes from our brain down to our gut. And it helps us improve our cardiovascular health. It helps improve immunity. Uh, and our, you know, all of these things are, are so now connected and in, you know, mindfulness, I know you're a big fan of that. That has a huge impact on it as well. That's really interesting. Thank you for explaining that. I think that, um, sometimes we get caught up in the neuroscience and we, we, oh, oh, when I think this thought, this happens and what you're talking about is very integrated. Um, and I find this to be true and, and teach it as well that, you know, when you don't get caught up on the little things, you get caught on the holistic view, kind of everything flows, everything comes along and, and it feels very intuitive and natural, yes. uh, which, which is what we're all really looking for, right? <laughs> ease. I think we're looking for ease because we live in a world of overwhelm. And, um, what I find is, um, all of us are, you know, run around really stressed out. It creates enormous levels of disengagement. You've seen the disengagement numbers and, you know, most of us in the workplaces are disengaged. And so it's, um, if we can just find our, a way for us, I believe authenticity and, and really practicing authenticity in ourselves and creating cultures of authenticity, create enormous discretionary energy for people to really bring all of who they are to really impact the workplace in, in, in amazing ways. I agree. And, and I also would say, and, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this too, periodically, you know, people are attracted to this idea and they feel powerless. They're like, well, but you know, my workplace doesn't support that. My workplace makes me work, you know, 10 hours a day, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They feel very powerless in the culture that they're in. And you're talking about, you know, and I agree that, you know, the cultures, when the culture shift, to, to hold a space for people to be authentic, it unleashes a lot of the personal power we each bring. Mm -hmm. I also think that each of us has the ability to simply begin to be authentic in a way, as you said, when be versus do. 
Mm-hmm. And, and part of the power of that, I think, is that when we are authentic, when we tap into some little piece of our own authenticity without the fear, without the defensiveness, it shows other people what it looks like. Absolutely. And, and then they begin to be able to do that. And, and we tend to discount our power to model uh, you know, little bits of it here and there and, and actually begin to shift the workplace, particularly if we're a leader. Because if yeah. we're a leader, I call it a culture bubble. You know, we live in a larger culture, but the, the people we manage, we create a little culture bubble for them. Yes. So we have greater influence within that culture bubble. And as we learn to do these practices, you know, we begin to sort of infect, I don't like that word, but <laughs> infect yeah. the culture. Make it viral. <laughs> make it viral. We can make it viral. <laughs> Viral authenticity. How awesome! There you go. Love it. <laughs> Let's trademark that right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, have have you experienced this with your clients within your work as well? So what I find is um, both in the positive and the negative, and probably is when it really stands out the most. Frankly, is when it's negative. You know, we've all had the opportunity to work on teams where the culture is toxic. Mm-hmm. And it really creates incredible um, disconnect for the people. And it, I've had the opportunity to work on teams where there's lack of trust and it gets in the way of getting real results on our businesses. And it's very hard to create trust on a team when people aren't really being authentic. I think they're so inextricably linked. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So I have to ask you just before we wrap up, so of the seven principles that you outline in the book, which one is your personal favorite? Well, it's sort of like your seven kids, you know, it's hard to say which is the favorite. <laughs> uh, I will say that um, the, there is one, which I alluded to earlier, which is choose be before do. And, and that the one I think is where the power is around really choosing um, authenticity and choosing who you're going to be before you take any action. That's kind of the the grounded in being mindful uh, around who am I as a leader and who who do I need to be right now and pulling from all the different parts of ourselves. We were talking earlier about we all have all these different parts, pulling from the most empowered parts of ourselves to say, you know, making a real empowered choice to say, who is the person that needs to be on stage right now uh, in order for this to have the, for me to be able to have the greatest impact as a leader. And, and so one of the concepts I talk about in the book is the concept of saboteurs. We all have these saboteur, fearful, fear stories. And a lot of times our actions, frankly, in the workplace and otherwise are driven by these fear thoughts that we have in our heads. And so being able to make that choice to say, I'm going to step out of my saboteur mode and I'm going to call out and find a, what I'm calling allies, which are other thoughts, more empowered thoughts that we can actually rewire our brains for. And every time we make that choice and move from a saboteur to an ally thought, um, that empowers us to make more of those choices. I completely rewire my brain. Yeah, I completely agree. I will share with you my favorite of the seven. Yes. <laughs> so, so I love them all. Like it is, and I don't have seven children, just for the record. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, but, but the one that the one that I love most is letting go. Yes. Because for me, on my personal journey, that was the true beginning. Like. Mm. You know, I read a lot of philosophy. I was meditating. I was doing yoga. I was working very hard. I was trying to be a leader. You know, I was doing all the right things. But when I learned to let go well is when I started making room for some of these things that we're talking about, you know, yeah. many years ago. And, and so that, for me, that was the beginning of the true journey where I began to see the changes and the shift in my life. Mm. Um, so, so for that reason, it's, it's my favorite. It was like my first child. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So what did you find was helpful for you in terms of letting go? Is there a particular area of letting go that was really helpful? Good question. That's another webinar, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) maybe we'll do that. (laughs) We should do that. Well, actually, okay. Let me put in a shameless plug here that, uh, in my online coaching community, the minute you get in, I give you what I call the emotional detriggering tool 
Yeah. Which is, it's just a simple one page exercise for how to find something that's got you emotionally stuck and transform it really, not just let it go, but transform it into a positive emotional gift. Awesome. And so, it, you know, it's the core, it's the core teaching because it's the doorway to everything else. Um, but, but I would say that that is the key is, is, you know, being with the negativity and then seeing that it's helping you grow somehow and then transforming that energy, that emotional energy in yourself to be grateful for what it's giving you. Um, awesome. You know, I, that, I would love to know more about it, actually. <laughs> okay. I mean, you just intrigued me enough to want to know more. And with the community, the authenticity community that I'm um, creating online, I would love to share that tool um, as yours with the community because we're creating a whole lot of tools on our website and resources for people. And I'd love to share whatever is really good that's out there. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about that after the video. Yeah, um, yeah let's do that. Obviously, there's a lot of opportunities for us to work together. And I just want to point out, too, that one of the, one of the keys to being authentic and letting go of your fear is what we're doing right now. So you and I have very complementary uh, teachings and you know, goals in life. And when you're not afraid, you're open to believing that everybody can support you, which otherwise would look competitive. Yes. And one of the things I love about you and many of the other Empower Women bloggers, many other people is, you know, there's is an assumption and a belief that there's enough to go around if we help each other, you know, the right people will find the right place. Yes. And I absolutely, we'll agree. Benefit. absolutely agree. And I think the key to that um, is, um, you know, going back to one of the practices I, f I find, and the key to that is what I call dancing with the dream. That's the final practice. And it's about engaging ourselves and with others in whatever brings us um, tremendous sense of joy. And I think both in, where, where both in you and I love um, an area of dancing with the dream is really seeing others grow. Like that is part of our core purpose and helping to empower others uh, is part of our core purpose. And so when you have a shared purpose, how, and, and it's in service of, of a bigger community, uh, you know, you can't help but focus on just being joyful in, in, in that place. Yep, exactly. So just to wrap up, tell people how, what they're going to find when they go to wired to authentic, wired for authenticity.com. You've got some free resources and stuff there. What, I, do, I do. So they can buy the book. <laughs> so buy the book <laughs> and if you buy the book please give me an Amazon review <laughs> um, the um, there's lots of resources we would love the first and foremost really is I, I'm part of what really is energizing me is I'm really creating a movement for authenticity at work um, if we can I really believe that what's that Margaret Mead quote you know uh, nothing ever has changed the world and you know with Okay, I'm going to botch this up, but there's a quote around, um, you know, any kind of change starts with a few concerned citizens who are really willing to work together to make it happen. And so I um, feel like if we can create a movement for authenticity in workplaces, I'm inviting anybody and everybody to come join that movement. Um, so please sign up. There's a sign up at the website. There's resources. Um, there's an assessment that you can do. There's a five minute assessment you can do that gives you your own results around you know how where are you in your authenticity practice what are some areas of strengths of these seven practices what are some areas of strengths for you where are some areas where you need more practice um, there are um, there is a download of a discussion guide you can get if you want to actually bring this to your team you know you can you know work with if you said you know as we talked about it organizational cultures take a lot of concerned citizens to band together to, to change. And so if there are groups of people or a few people in your organization or even in your book club that you want to bring into the discussion, there's a discussion guide. Um, there's lots of other resources. So please join us. There's a 52 week block series where uh, once a week you get a very simple tool that you can use to advance in your own authenticity. Oh, nice, good. Well, I, I will put the, uh, the URL down below on this video and encourage people to go there, buy the book, leave a review. I'll leave mine later today. Thank you. Um, 
and uh, and and join the community. So I'm I'm going to go ahead and close out the video. Obviously, you and I will continue to talk and collaborate and find ways to to share, you know, with both our communities the the good work we're doing. So I want to thank everyone who's been watching the video. Um, I hope you'll visit us at empowerwomen.com and wiredforauthenticity.com. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, as you explore these concepts in your own life. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Dana. Thanks, Anna.